Um, so I wanted to to start off just kind of with a, a little bit of an introduction to me that's relevant to this talk. Um, so this is is the the Keck School of Medicine at USC in Los Angeles. I came here as a medical student from UC Berkeley, and uh, about halfway through my uh, time, I started uh, working with this this trio of people, uh, Carol Spencer in, in the middle, and on the left, John Nikoloff, and on the right, uh, John Lopresti, uh, who are largely responsible, or if not totally responsible, for the USC Endocrine Lab. And I'm sure you, uh, many people out there have heard Dr. Spencer talk in the past. Um, but as a result of working with them, uh, this was the, the first first author paper that I ever published um, when I was a resident at, at USC, and it was about thyroglobulin. Uh, so my, my career has rolled on to different elements of the thyroid, thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, uh, but I've always remained uh, fairly close to, to thinking about thyroglobulin, certainly in the clinic uh, with the patients. So um, what I want to try and do in large part is just talk about thyroglobulin uh, in, in, in a conceptual way. Um, it's amazing people come in having had thyroid cancer for many years and don't really have a concept of what is going on when we tell them about this test. And that's perfectly fine. People don't have to know all about what, what these tests are, but I think it is good. And you know, for the people here and the people uh, on the Zoom, you know, you all are are the most engaged people. Uh, whether you're online, whether you just you know talk to others, I think if if I can educate uh, you to the extent that that uh, uh, things have to do with this, it's I think you will spread this to to others as well, which would be fantastic. Um, so a little bit about just thyroglobulin, its measurement, and then kind of its clinical interpretation as well. Um, but really thinking about that last part, that clinical interpretation part, I mean, that's the, that's very case dependent. And so in terms of, of interaction, what you all are thinking about or what you want to know along the way, what questions you have, um, we're, we're, a, we're a, an intimate group here. So feel free to interrupt. I have nothing that's so important to say that you can't interrupt me, please. Please. Um, so, so what is thyroglobulin, right? So it's this big protein that has sugars stuck to it. So it's a glycoprotein. Um, and it's unique to the thyroid. We know that it only comes from the thyroid. And, it, you know, that goes from when we're babies through, through our entire life. If, we, if we're going to have it in our body, it's going to derive from thyroid cells. And it participates in thyroid hormone production, as we'll see in a second. So for thyroid cancer patients, um, it, it can be a marker of thyroid cancer, the most common types of thyroid cancer, the differentiated thyroid cancer, um, because those came from the thyroid at one point. So thyroglobulin may, might tell us that thyroid cancer is still there, or if it's changing, it might tell us, is, do we think this thyroid cancer is getting worse or do we think that it's getting better? So here's, here's the, the thyroid. And then if we look inside the thyroid, we have these little rings of thyroid follicular cells that function to make thyroid hormone. That's what the thyroid's all about. So if we look right, you know, close, really up close into what's going on here in the thyroid, what we're going to see is that the thyroid follicular cell in white in the middle, sorry, I'm tall, um, is going to take up iodine from the left-hand side, from the blood, and then that's going to go across to the, to the right-hand side into that colloid space, into that little pool. And that's where thy most thyroglobulin is gonna be. It's this big protein and it's gonna have the iodine attached to it and it's gonna have the parts of thyroid hormone attached to it. And the, the reactions that's gonna that take iodine and stick it together with the other 
part of the molecule is what makes thyroid hormone. And then thyroid hormone is going to come back through the thyroid cell and get back out into the blood. And when it does, some thyroglobulin is going to go with it. And so uh, for people out there in the world that still have thyroids or maybe half of a thyroid, uh, thyroglobulin is, is normal. It's, it's part of life. Uh, and so it exists, it exists in the blood under normal circumstances. It would be higher if someone just has more thyroid. Maybe they have a goiter, maybe they have big nodules, they might have more. And so measuring thyroglobulin, if someone just has a thyroid nodule, say, before they've been diagnosed with thyroid cancer, isn't going to be helpful in saying, it, you know, should we be worried or not? And generally, it's not recommended to check thyroglobulin just if someone has a thyroid nodule, because it's, we know that it's there. It can also be high if there's thyroid inflammation, thyroid gland destruction, um, or or causes of inflammation. It can be higher if there's just more thyroid activity. So people who have hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, there'll be more. And when is it going to be lower? So if someone has a thyroid, it's going to be lower if they've had some of that thyroid removed or all of the thyroid removed. Or say if someone uh, had hypothyroidism before thyroid surgery and was on thyroid medication and their thyroid wasn't doing anything anymore, it would be lower too. So a normal thyroid gland, thyroglobulin is going to vary quite a bit, single digits to you know, 30s, 40s perhaps. If we just took half the thyroid out and kept all of the other things the same, the thyroglobulin would go down by about half. And then if someone has the whole thing removed, uh, there may still be a little bit that's measurable. Why would that be if, we've had, if we say you've had a to total thyroidectomy. Well, a long time ago, people had, we called it subtotal thyroidectomies, where a little piece may have been left. Uh, and then near total thyroidectomy to mean, well, we took most of it, but you know there were some that maybe was still there. And now we say total thyroidectomy because the intention is to remove every bit of the thyroid. But obviously the surgeon doesn't want to remove everyone's parathyroids. Uh, the surgeon wants to be careful about that recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so a thyroid remnant is not an uncommon thing, but we're talking about something incredibly small, one gram of tissue, something that, that can't necessarily be seen. But when we're measuring thyroglobulin in the blood, we're measuring an extremely small amount of something. And so just because thyroglobulin is detectable after total thyroidectomy doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong. We're going to come back to that idea. So theoretically speaking, when the thyroid has been removed, you know, thyroglobulin becomes something that tells us about thyroid cancer for the most part. Although not necessarily every thyroid cancer. So, you know, we're talking about the most common types applicable to most patients with thyroid cancer. Um, but we are talking about the differentiated thyroid cancers as papillary thyroid cancers, follicular thyroid cancers, and oncocytic, what we used to call herthal up until so recently that I still call it herthal all the time because I have to work on that habit. Um, but those cancers, and those are the follicular cells. Those are the cells that we got that close up of when we zoomed in. So there's also medullary thyroid cancer, right? That's a C cell that's inside the thyroid. Doesn't make thyroglobulin, doesn't participate in this conversation at all, unfortunately. Maybe for, but if you're here, hopefully we're, we're talking about our differentiated thyroid cancers. And then there's thyroglobulin antibody, which We'll, we'll, we'll talk about in this also, but thyroglobulin antibody is maybe coming from that lymphocyte, white cell, immune cell. That's what makes antibodies, right? We've lived through a pandemic. We've heard a lot about antibodies. Uh, people are much more familiar than maybe they were a few years ago. It makes my conversation easier. Um, but thyroglobulin antibody isn't made by the thyroid. It isn't made by the thyroid cancer. It's made by the immune system. 
So what what makes thyroglobulin increase, right? So we, if we're not talking about the thyroid itself, how much does the thyroid cancer make? Thyroid cancers seem to have different capacities to make or release thyroglobulin that's measured. How much TSH is there? So if the thyroid itself, when it gets TSH, it tells the thyroid to be more active. TSH is the signal to make thyroid hormone. If a thyroid makes thyroid hormone, it, it has make, we're gonna measure more thyroglobulin. If we go back to what thyroglobulin does, it's thyroid cancer is the same way for the most part. You have more TSH, you can release more thyroglobulin. And then there's the amount. So if, if a thyroid cancer has a certain capacity to make thyroglobulin, and a TSH is at the same level of, of stimulation, then if thyroglobulin changes, that's going to tell us something potentially about the amount of thyroid cancer that's there. And then going back to the idea that thyroglobulin does come from the, the normal thyroid, and there may be a thyroid remnant after surgery, thyroglobulin can still be present, tell us something about, hey, there's some thyroid tissue here. Okay, so that was all about thyroid hormone. Okay, have I lost everybody? Is there any, any? Okay, good. So measuring thyroglobulin is like a whole bit of confusion that can go on as well. And so these are these are some slides that that uh, I have adapted from Dr. Spencer. Is kind enough to let me use some of them. But we're talking about how do we measure thyroglobulin. So on the left hand side, you've got the thyroglobulin that's in the your in the blood in your blood. Say so your is a general term, um, and we take that sample, we put it into the machine. So here we have some amount of thyroglobulin, and what we have on the other side is this system with an antibody, typically that's going to grab onto part of that thyroglobulin as it floats by. Right? And so now we've, now we've got a hold on it. And then we're going to take this other antibody and it's going to connect to the other side. And it has a, a reporter on it. It has something that's going to give us a signal. Right? So one antibody, one thyroglobulin, two antibodies, two thyroglobulins. So the more that's there, the more signal we get. Okay? And so then we can say, we can quantify, we can say how much thyroglobulin is there based on how much gets stuck in this little sandwich. Okay, so what about our thyroglobulin antibody, right? Again, we, we th thyroglobulin antibody is pretty common. We measure it in a fair number of the general population, but more common in people who have differentiated thyroid cancer. And so if we have our free thyroglobulin floating around, you know, the antibody is going to glom onto it. This is the antibody that's present in the blood. We measure it, we say, hey, someone has thyroglobulin antibody, what's it doing? It's glomming on to that thyroglobulin in the body. So now let's change our picture of testing. Here we are again, but now we've got the thyroglobulin with all that stuff glommed onto it, right? And so now when it floats by our test, it can't be bound, can't be attached because it's got all this stuff stuck to it already. And then we also have our, maybe our other antibody that it's trying to hook on to the other side and it's got something in its way. So what happens if none of these things don't attach to our test the way we intend them to? They all get washed away. And so now we're looking for that signal. We're looking for that reporter. We want to count one thyroglobulin, two thyroglobulin, and we see nothing. All right, so what is the main effect of thyroglobulin antibody on measuring thyroglobulin? False negatives. Getting no reading that there's any thyroglobulin there because it was there, but none of it stuck, right? So that's when we say, what's wrong with thyroglobulin antibody? You get false negatives. This is the explanation. And so how are we overcoming that? So one way our different types of assay, assay, fancy word for test, right? So, so the, ant, the, the test that instead of having one, I can see it on the screen maybe, but 
instead of having one of these, you have lots and lots of different ones. They look different, different shapes and sizes. You know, thyroglobulin is a pretty big molecule. If you can grab onto the, 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 the left elbow instead of the, the right knee, maybe you can grab it even if there's an antibody stuck to another part of it, right? So if you can grab it in different ways, you can see it even if the antibody is making it difficult to see. The second way, which you may have heard of, is mass spec. You know, often it gets sent to a reference lab, Mayo Clinic, and this is totally different. This is breaking down the molecule into a ton of little chunks, and those chunks end up being unique. Each protein, all its little chunks, pretty easy to tell the difference from one protein to another protein. So this should get around the issue of having antibody there. Uh, if uh, you've been around, you've heard that this still appears to have problems, something about the step of getting to the test. There's still false negatives, um, which we'll see, um, but it's certainly an attempt to try and get, get around this problem. So what are, what are the processes right now? This is a little overly pedantic, but I was like, okay, look, we'll just go through all the steps. So step one, we wanna know what the TSH is. If we're gonna say, we wanna, what's your thyroglobulin? We wanna know that piece, TSH stimulation, because if for whatever reason, you know, the TSH is high, someone missed medication, forgot medication, who knows what, the thyroglobulin might be higher. And that isn't necessarily, we don't want to confuse that for getting worse. So what's the TSH? Number two, measure thyroglobulin antibody. It has to be done every single time because if, it's, if we get a low result, we don't want to be fooled that it's a false negative. And then step three, determine the method. If there's no thyroglobulin antibody, we're fine using any old test. If there is thyroglobulin antibody, we need to go to one of these other directions, the radioimmune assay, uh, which has been used for a long time, maybe a mass spec assay, uh, if we're uh, happy with it or get happier with it. And then we get to step four, measure the thyroglobulin. We have four steps in before we can measure thyroglobulin. Um, and then step five, doing this in the same laboratory again and again. So. This is absolutely the case for antibody measurements and thyroglobulin measurements. TSH, not so much. Uh, TSH has been harmonized, you know, universally made pretty darn consistent. Um, and so it need not necessarily be the case, but I don't know who's going to get their TSH somewhere and then going to get, to get their thyroglobulin somewhere else when we're, we wanna do all these tests at the same time anyway. So making sure we're using the same laboratory. All right, so, so here, here we get to uh, kind of the, the visual representation of what we're talking about here. So three through six on the bottom, the IMAs, these are like our typical, you're gonna go get a test and this is what it's gonna be testing. Um, so number one, the, the blue bars are the, are the range of the test. So these ranges differ, different tests, different ranges, okay? Each dot represents a, a, a test that was done in each of these assays. So you see these dots aren't all the same. The blue dots go, are, are in a different range. What might be out of the range in one might not be out of the range in another. So if we're going from test A to test B to test C, this is apples to oranges in comparing, okay? And then what we also see are the red dots. The red dots are the antibody positive samples. And we see that with the typical test of three through six, we get false negative results. Okay, just what we talked about. Now we compare that to the different RIA methods. That's kind of our, what do we, how do we change if we have antibody positives? that maybe we can grab onto this and measure it even if there's an antibody there, we see we're not getting those false negative results. 
almost at all. So we kind of rescue those samples and can measure the thyroglobulin uh, much better uh, if there's antibody positive. All right, so that was all about how to measure thyroglobulin moving into now kind of clinically, what are we doing you know, when we're seeing patients? Anything from you guys about difficulties with measuring it or how it's measured? No one's fallen asleep yet, even though it's after lunch, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> So how would the patient know um, whether or not the same lab was used? Because we, my daughter had thyroid cancer and the thyroglobulin and the antibody, they were pretty steadily coming down. And then they went up a little bit the, at the, during the next lab cycle. And, you know, of course i as a mom, I was freaking out about that, but I was told by the physician that it was a different assay. So is that the same thing that you're talking about, that it was maybe sent to a different lab and how would the patient yeah. know that? Yeah, so, so ge generally speaking, if you're using the same lab, they're using the same test. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to promote anybody, but if you go to Quest, then Quest uses the same test to measure their thyroglobulin. If you go to LabCorp, LabCorp has a test that they use. If you go to your university hospital, they're using, they got a machine in the, in the back and that's the test that they use. So for the most part, you know, if you go to a lab, that's the test that's being used. Now they, they could change that. They could you know, change the, the, the manufacturer that they get that test from. Um, so not a lot you could do about that. Um, but that can, that, that should be identifiable on the report somewhere on the report. It's going to say, we used X test to measure thyroglobulin X test to measure thyroglobulin antibody. And you'd be able to see, you know, did that, did that change? Um, now, if an antibody, uh, if a thyroglobulin antibody sample is negative at the first check, then the, th the thyroglobulin might be measured on test A, the test we use if the antibody is negative. If the next time you go in, the antibody is positive, then the thyroglobulin test will also potentially change to the assay that would fit when the thyroglobulin antibody is positive. They might even send it out to a place where they do a different kind of testing. So in that sense, the, the thyroglobulin assay might change appropriately. You, you know, it needs to in that sense. Um, so the first answer is hopefully if you're going to the same place, we are not encountering this problem to, you know, the doctor may be looking at the fine print, essentially, in that case. But I was just wondering why my immune system would make antibodies to something that's like normal in my blood. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like why, why that happens? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Why do we make antibodies to things that are that are part of us? I mean, when we talk about autoimmune conditions, be they thyroid, type one diabetes, still in endocrine, elsewhere, lupus, you know, things that aren't my, aren't my forte. These are all examples of times when the immune system is getting it wrong. The thyroid seems to be a pretty common one. So when we look at, at you know, the US population screening study, you've got, you know, 10%-ish people who may have different, different forms of antibodies uh, that exist against the thyroid. And it's kind of common within the hormone world, right? You know, type one diabetes is a problem. Thyroid issues are a problem. Endocrine organs kind of look unique. They're kind of weird. They make these proteins that don't exist anywhere else in the body, right? And so maybe it's a little bit easier for the body to kind of get confused about why this thing is here. If you still had a thyroid, the antibodies wouldn't necessarily affect your thyroid function. 
Not so not necessarily. Okay. People who have thyroid peroxidase or TPO antibody have an increased risk of developing thyroid problems. People who have thyroglobulin antibodies, who, there is a less strong correlation with thyroid hormone problems. Um, and then again, you know, when they exist towards, when someone has thyroglobulin antibody and they've had a diagnosis of thyroid cancer and they've had their thyroid taken out, let's say, let's say before so before they even had the cancer, they had thyroglobulin antibody, right? Maybe that antibody is just going to still be there, right? Just like we make antibodies to chicken pox from a million years ago. But oftentimes they, they do go away, right? You, you've, you've gotten rid of that thing that the body didn't like. You've got rid, rid of the thyroid and we see antibodies go away over time. Um, and so declining antibodies are okay even the stable antibodies seem to largely be okay, which the slides will we'll get to. And, but, but we do get worried when they're going up because you know if there's something new for the immune system to react to that's making thyroglobulin, that could be thyroid cancer. So after surgery for thyroid cancer, you know, if we're, we're typically talking about total thyroidectomy, not in every case, but typically. Thyroglobulin can be measured after about four weeks. That's when it seems to settle down to the level that it's going to be at. Why not before? Well, we, we just got into the neck and squished things up and cut things. And a lot of what was in the thyroid cells might have have been released and get gotten into the bloodstream. So we wait a little while, okay? If at four weeks, that thyroglobulin level is higher than we expect, there may still be some thyroid cancer that we haven't gotten. Some people, we may know about this. If it's, if it's metastatic, if it's severe, some people, we may have thought things were complete, but we need to rethink that. Or the, or the levels are gonna be low and we're gonna monitor, and after that, the changes, the rise may mean that thyroid cancer is coming back. Okay. People may have heard of measuring thyroglobulin while on medication versus off of medication or with stimulation. This is becoming much less common because our way of measuring thyroglobulin is much more sensitive, measuring down to the point two range is, is uh, you know, measuring essentially, you know, kind of the limit of what can be there. In the past, when we could only measure to, you know, higher numbers and below a certain number, we just didn't know if it was there or not. Stimulating it to get into the range we could measure it was helpful, right? Because now we could tell if any, um, any was there or not. But it, if it is certainly less common to do so now. Okay. Dr. Angel, we have uh, one question from online. Um, post RAI treatment, how frequently must we test the thyroid globulin levels? My lab that it's approved by my insurance uses a method called chemiluminescence. Is that reliable in your opinion? So to answer the second part first, yes, uh, that term would represent the most common type of testing. Um, the, the, the part about how frequently we'll, we'll come to touch on, the short answer is it depends. Uh, and so it, it hopefully we're co we'll, we'll cover a little bit you know, when we get to that. Um, so very typically people underwent total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine ablation. It's not, not the world we live in universally anymore, but at some point, it didn't matter who you were, you showed up, that's what you got. And so we have some, some excellent data about what thyroglobulin should be in those patients. And they're very, very helpful. If thyroglobulins are undetected, little arrow, less than, you know, we, 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 we didn't measure any. And we've done an ultrasound of the neck, we've done some imaging, there's nothing abnormal there after surgery. We call that an excellent response. The risk of recurrence and death is super duper low. Okay. 
people can have what we call an indeterminate response to that initial therapy. Thyroglobulins are a little higher, uh, up to one, if your TSH is, is suppressed. And if we stimulate it up to 10, or, you know, we're talking about thyroglobulin today. Also, if you have some imaging that we're not sure about, but these people also are going to do excellently uh, in during follow-up. Okay. Most people are, are going to just stay there or resolve very low risk of death. And then there's what we would call biochemically incomplete, meaning those thyroglobulins are now high enough that there's a real concern that there's something residual there that we should go look for and find. If you have a, a unstimulated level that's greater than one, a stimulated level that's greater than 10, some of those people still, it's all going to be fine but there's a greater chance that we're going to find something that needs uh, additional treatment um, and either, either be cured after that or uh, you know, continue to be followed after that. So I'll make a point that you know, data tend to come from, uh, or at least data of this kind, tend to come from academic places where there's maybe more uniformity in the surgeon and the approach. Um, and you know that remnant thyroid might be a little bit bigger in some people and, and compared to other people. So thyroglobulins may be a little bit higher in, other, in some people and other people. And uh, you know, stable thyroglobulin levels with no imaging findings are a relatively benign thing. All right, so we talked about people who had a total thyroidectomy and got radioactive iodine. Let's take it a step back in the process. We've had a total thyroidectomy. We're trying to decide about radioactive iodine, right? So thyroglobulin comes up in this context. This is text from the American Thyroid Association guidelines, uh, the current ones, that say the disease, you know, looking at the disease uh, status should be considered in determining whether or not we use additional treatment. That the post-operative serum thyroglobulin can help in assessing what disease is there when we measure it after surgery. But that the optimal cutoff for this is, is not known. So we're, 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 we're going a little bit with uh, imperfect information. So this is an excellent uh, study. Uh, it came out a little bit before the, that paper that I put in, as I showed you in the beginning. So we call that getting scooped, always problematic in academics, but we still made things happen. Um, and, and, what it, and what it looked at was patients with papillary thyroid cancer who did not undergo radioactive iodine and, and what was the role of thyroglobulin. And what it really nicely showed is that in people who had some initial low elevation of thyroglobulin followed over several years, that level declined with time and fell into a perhaps detectable but very low point something range that was not concerned. Patients did not have evidence of recurrence, did not have you know, any positive lymph nodes or anything like that. And the uh, conclusion was that routine radioactive iodine just for persistent thyroglobulin is, is, you know, shouldn't be considered necessary in all patients. So these are some of, of our data that looked at low risk thyroid cancer patients who did not receive radioactive iodine after a total thyroidectomy. And these levels were all less than 0.5 essentially in the point something category um, and stayed that way for many years. Patients followed uh, some of them more than 10 years. So really kind of some consistent findings that patients who have detectable thyroglobulin without radioactive iodine are often, do not show any signs of disease. So this is an extremely useful systematic review that was recently generated coming out of the new American Thyroid Association Guidelines Task Force review. And this is 
the abstract. So just, just a glimpse at everything they looked at. Um, but talking about following total th thyroidectomy without radioactive iodine, there was limited evidence, uh, but very low rate of recurrence and metastases and that thyroglobulin levels are usually stable and low. Well. So this is going, going to what I said, they're, they're finding that we still don't have enough evidence, but low and stable levels are, are okay. Um, we, we have tried to, put, uh, or you know, researchers have tried to put out their risk stratification in patients who have not had radioactive iodine that are helpful. Uh, I think they're a little bit stringent perhaps, but if, if thyroglobulin is low, you have an excellent response, that's great. Monitoring only. Responses that are indeterminate, that thyroglobulin can be higher because you didn't get ablation of maybe the normal remnant, but levels that are up to five on medication or up to 10 with suppression um, may warrant some additional uh, intervention imaging to make sure we don't see any persistent cancer. We can start to think about radioactive iodine, maybe a diagnostic scan to see something, or maybe even a first dose of treatment. And then patients who have even higher levels of thyroglobulin after a total thyroidectomy, you know, again, looking to see if there's any detectable disease, particularly that would be re removable with, with surgery and then thinking about the need for radioactive iodine. So this whole time we, we had step one, everyone gets total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. Step two, people get total thyroidectomy without radioactive iodine. Even now we're talking about what kind of surgery should people have? Do, does everyone need a total thyroidectomy? The answer certainly appears to be no in some people with a low risk papillary thyroid cancer have a lobectomy, partial thyroidectomy. The question down the road after the surgeon, when you get to the endocrinologist is, well, can we use thyroglobulin for these patients at all? And been the subject of several studies, just to show you one that I think is easy to understand, looking at thyroglobulin at different time points, uh, the patients who had recurrence and didn't have recurrence there's no detectable cutoff to tell the difference between these two. Yes, there's some recurrent, you know, some people with recurrence are a little bit higher, but on average, they're too similar to, to tell the difference. And so again, going back to this same very well done review, looking, say, following partial thyroidectomy, thyroglobin lens is not accurate for diagnosis of recurrence and metastases. And the estimates are just too imprecise. As I kind of going back to that fundamental concept, thyroglobulin gets made by the normal thyroid. If you still have half a thyroid, there's going to be a, a round and that's going to be hard to, to distinguish. So I think we are still left with really relying mostly on imaging for people who have had a lobectomy. The most important thing is if, if you've been told that a lobectomy is sufficient treatment for your thyroid cancer, it was a low risk thyroid cancer, you know, and, and the, the hard data say that the outcomes are good. There are very few recurrences uh, that occur, very few adverse outcomes. And so, you know, maybe we shouldn't be overly concerned that we don't get to stare at that thyroglobulin result twice a year or once a year. All right, so what about following it long-term? So how often does thyroglobulin need to be monitored? Really depends, really depends. If you look at uh, the interval from the current guidelines, there's sort of anywhere from a every three months to an every two year uh, kind of window that's potentially uh, appropriate. What, what would make a shorter interval better or longer interval better? I think, I think you know, you all are smart cookies. If we're more worried that there's something going on, we're going to measure it more frequently. And if, and if you're someone who's 10 years out, 20 years out, and, and every time we check it, it's undetectable or the same, we're probably going to be fine checking it once a year, even every other year. I see a lot of patients coming in, you know, they had a good year, but now they're stressed out. 
If they got to come see me, they got to, you know, find what their thyroid globulin is. If I could spread that out, that anxiety for to just every other year, I would be fine because I think, you know, they're fine. All right. So what are the considerations we should care about? How high is it? How fast is it changing? And what we're going to do is going to depend a little bit on the subtype. So when thyroid globulin is still moderately low, we want to do imaging of different kinds, right? The ultrasound of the neck, cervical lymph nodes is where thyroid cancer, a papillary thyroid cancer is going to probably most often hide. Maybe a CT scan of the neck, especially if someone's had a lymph node dissection because your typical ultrasound is going to look all around. But if you've already had a lymph node dissection, the next lymph node might be very high or very low. So a CT can be a little bit better for that. And then maybe a CT scan of the chest, particularly for follicular thyroid cancer. I know it's much more rare, but those aren't going to be found in the lymph node as much. The follicular cancer likes to spread more distantly. And then maybe radioactive iodine scanning. When the thyroid globulin is even higher, more than 10, the American Thyroid Association is going to say maybe a PET scan. Our, our sensitivity for picking up something is going to be higher once the thyroid globulin gets to that point. And then if something's rising very quickly and we can't find something, maybe even considering radioactive iodine treatment empirically. So that's the how high, how about the how fast? So this is uh, uh, data again, you can tell when Dr. Spencer's slides are in here. <laughs> but how, if, if here we see a box where the doubling time, how long it takes for thyroid globulin to double on the upper left is short, steep, down to the lower right is flat. It's not gonna double forever. And then when we come over to the left, we see that the survival of purple, where the doubling time is fast, the survival is short. And where the doubling time is long, survival is long, right? So um, if, if the thyroid globulin isn't changing, it's probably not a lot happening, even if it's a little bit elevated. And if that thyroid globulin is changing quickly, we need to be more worried, okay? So that is kind of my summary about how we're checking it. So I'm all for questions. Here's the thyroid globulin, and it's going up. If you were to look at how fast it's going up, it's going to double in less than a year. Okay. Uh, let's take blue line over here, thyroid globulin over time, not doubling. Okay. So what this is showing us is patient time and their survival. So purple line corresponds to those patients with the really fast doubling time, their survival is going down. They are not surviving. Blue line are the patients who have a thyroid globulin that's stable, their survival stays at 100%. So that's to show that if the thyroid globulin is increasing quickly, the survival is worse. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Sorry. You've taught me something today. I explained this slide badly. I will go back and... <laughs> what about when the thyroglobulin goes down? Sure, so it, it would depend on the circumstance. So we have a large number of patients for whom their thyroid cancer is relatively low risk because that's the majority of thyroid cancer. After surgery, there is some thyroid globulin that's still there, and it is slowly dwindling over time. That's great, okay? There is a very small subset of patients who have more aggressive thyroid cancer. Maybe we know they have metastases. We can see it in their lungs or other places. When their thyroid globulin goes quickly down, we might get more worried. In the, in the absence of treatment, in the absence of we just did something and now we think it's better. But if we're just monitoring and it goes down quickly, we might get more worried. Okay, why is that? Thyroid globulin is made by the cancer cell. We're measuring it. If that cancer cell changes in a way where it stops making thyroid globulin, 
Whereas making a thyroglobulin that's so weird, we can't even measure it anymore. We might call that de-differentiated. That might be a step on the road to becoming more aggressive, becoming more weird, growing faster, being harder to treat, all of those things. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's what you were getting at or not, but that's the kind of wrinkle to what, to when th going down would be bad, but in general, we would think it's good. Okay, one question is, Oops, is sorry. age a factor in this doubling time and survival rates? Um, age is going to be a factor in, in survival rate very generally. Um, older patients, if you're diagnosed with thyroid cancer at an older age, the prognosis is generally a little bit worse. I don't think that age has an impact on thyroglobulin directly. How old you are doesn't affect from what your thyroglobulin is necessarily. Um, but for two people who had the exact same trends, and one of them is 20 and one of them is 70 or 80, the older patient is at higher risk. You know, thyroid, the, the, the prognosis of thyroid cancer tends to be a little worse. Okay, one more question. Um, do you sometimes see increased TG after treatment that remains stable and never eventually progresses to reoccurrence? I'm three years post thyroidectomy and ablative RII, but I continue to have TG between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Okay. Um, the an short answer, yes, absolutely. Um, and we're talking about thyroglobulins that are less than one. So, I, you know, I, I think I think we should find that to be very, very reassuring that, that there's very little going on. Um, but we can imagine thyroglobulins that are even a little bit higher. One, two, something like that. Um, I, you know, from a clinical standpoint, there, there is a low risk of mortality associated with that, you know, even if a low risk of detecting disease in the future, uh, if, if we can't find anything from the outset. There are a couple of things that are possible. One is that there's a normal thyroid remnant. Should we have gotten rid of that with our radioactive iodine? Yes, but full ablation of thyroid remnants isn't complete. Even, even in the best done New England Journal publication studies, it wasn't 100%. Second possibility is there, there is a thyroid cancer, there is some thyroid cancer there. Where is it likely to be? It's likely to be in a lymph node, right, right where the cancer was. Well, we can, we, we've, we've looked there you, you know, 10 different ways. We've looked there with ultrasounds and CT scans and radio iodine scans, and we can't see anything. So it, it's, it's 10 cells hiding in a, in a lymph node. And if you have that your whole life, then, then you're happy. You, you know, you die of old age. So that's okay too. Um, and so, you know, we see that all the time and, and, continue to do routine surveillance and try and be reassuring. Going back to the presence of thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibody in the setting of total thyroidectomy and complete radioactive iodine ablation, if you have detectable thyroglobulin levels, even though low, theoretically, this means that you have some residual disease that's sort of percolating along or kept suppressed, right? I, you know, I think that we can't exclude that possibility. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want someone to say, you know, I went to another doctor and they said I had thyroid cancer and you didn't. Cer certainly it, it is, it, you know, potentially likely. Um, but, you know, if we say that at point two, we can't even measure it anymore. You know, we can't even measure thyroglobulin that well. Well, and, 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 and it's, and it's point three. I mean, someone blew over the machine or something, right? Yeah. So, so if we're getting levels like above one, mm -hmm. you, you know, in, in that range, then yeah. Yeah, I think it's very plausible that there's something residual that can't be found. And is there a theory that 
um, you always have some kind of tumor burden in that setting because otherwise why would your immune system be creating persistent antibodies? Yeah, so sorry if I was answering a slightly different question. So if you have persistent antibody, mm -hmm. I think it is much less clear that, that there is definite persistent thyroid cancer. Uh, if, if, I were, if, if antibodies go up, I think there's legitimate concern. If they're declining, we think that's consistent with, you know, not having any thyroid cancer. But there are people who have thyroglobulin antibodies that would predate their cancer. We don't go around checking thyroglobulin antibodies in everybody. Well, you, they, you know, they do, but, but it's not necessarily the case that it would, it would dissipate. Um, or, or it may dissipate for years, you know, it may not dissipate for years. So it would depend on, well, how long had we been following this patient, but because this is a surrogate, right? Because we're, we're, we're not measuring something directly. I don't think we could be sure that, that it means you have a burden of disease, the antibody. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess just thinking that if you, at some point with age want to diminish the amount of TSH suppression due to potential side effects like atrial fibrillation or something, and you want to decrease your level of suppression, are you actually taking the lid off that pot to, of the disease burden that remains that's going to start um, producing again, mm -hmm. growing? Yeah. So, so asking the question, you know, we talk about reducing TSH suppression, particularly as we get older, but we're, we're doing it for some reason, right? To, to, to keep thyroid cancer from growing. So are we going to cause issues with that? Um, it, you know, there's going to be kind of a risk benefit trade-off. I think if there are people who there's legitimate concern of persistent thyroid cancer, we know they still have thyroid cancer, we're going to have to weigh that against those risks of TSH suppression. Maybe it's better to continue TSH suppression. Um, if, if we feel like that risk is low, and we're talking about going from a TSH of less than 0.5 to 0.5 to 2, you know, we're not talking about stimulating the heck out of, of this thing with tons of TSH. And so, it, you know, I think the likelihood is low. Um, but I understand your, your point, certainly. Um, and, and I don't think there are a whole lot of data about that. I think there will be, because we'll have taken a lot of people and gone through this process since the 2015 guidelines. You talked about going as long as two years without getting it checked. For the longest term survivors, who are low risk, would you ever extend that to even longer than two years or not check the TG at all? Yeah, it, it, you know, we li live in a world where we think about the outlier. You know, would I be entirely comfortable with that? You know, maybe not. Um, if you were diagnosed with a papillary thyroid cancer, in, in, in your 40s, it was treated, we've monitored you decade after decade, and, and now you're 85 years old. And, uh, you, you know, I, I believe in my heart of hearts, I probably could never check a thyroglobulin again, and, and nothing would happen. Um, but we're often driven by the very rare, you know, possibilities. Um, so someone's presumably going to their doctor once a year, it's not so burdensome to, to have it done. I'm more concerned about the doctor who doesn't want to do it. <laughs> I don't think we're to that point yet. <laughs> All right, we have one more here in, in person, and then I'm going to go check on mine and just uh, hold it close. Okay, sorry. Me again. Um, I was wondering if if you had antibodies pre thyroid cancer, everything could that cause hypothyroidism due to it them binding with like active thyroid hormone in your blood, or not really? Um, not 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 really in that <laughs> sense. But so these antibodies against the thyroid when you have a thyroid thyroglobulin antibody, TPO antibody, 
um, those two are, are not predominantly the cause. They are more the, the sign. So, so these are conditions mediated by T cells infiltrating the thyroid, uh, you, you know, responding to, to parts of the thyroid cell they don't like, talking to other immune cells, talking to the cells that make antibodies, and then those cells start making antibodies as part of this sort of coordinated inflammatory response. And then those antibodies are targeted against parts of the thyroid cell. So they, they you know, presumably attach to the thyroid cell. They may do additional damage. They might sit there as a little flag to tell other immune cells to, to come get the thyroid too, but they aren't antibodies against thyroid hormone. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And so it's the thyroid cells, not the yes. hormone. So, so what, what's going to happen is the thyroid's going to lose the ability to make hormone because it's being damaged. Thank you. If, if, if you have time for one more question, we'll do the last question online and then close out. Okay, the question is, can pregnancy affect TG and TGAB levels post-thyroidectomy? Great, great question, great question. Um, so uh, it, just, to, just to think about a normal person with a normal thyroid, thyroglobulin is probably going to go up during pregnancy because of the physiology of pregnancy. And uh, if you look at people's thyroids, maybe nodules get a little bit bigger during pregnancy and then return to their normal size afterwards. So in someone who has thyroid cancer, has residual thyroglobulin, maybe there is a, a little bump up that we might see um, that, that likely is going to go down during pregnancy. Um, there's a lot of concern, a lot of literature about can thyroid cancer get worse during pregnancy. If a person goes into pregnancy with an excellent response to therapy, no evidence of disease, it is extremely unlikely that it develops during or because of pregnancy. In people who have evidence of disease, who have detectable thyroid cancer at the time of pregnancy, there is some risk of progression during pregnancy. Um, and that, that wouldn't be just true of thyroglobulin, that could be true of actual size of, of tumors and such as well. Um, so I hope that, hope, hope that answers the question a bit. Antibody levels, uh, gosh, I'm less certain, um, but we know that many antibody levels will go down during the second and third trimester of pregnancy as a result of some immune chillaxing because there's a, another entity in there that it that it doesn't want to be reacting to um so that that may be the case but i i have to say i'm not sure offhand give me something to look for look up thank you so much for your time thank you everybody thank you guys